Today we have John McCune, who is a research system scientist for Scilab here at Carnegie Mellon University, where he earned his PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering and received the A.G. Jordan Thesis Award. John's research interests include secure systems, trusted computing, virtualization, and spontaneous interaction between mobile devices. Please welcome John McCune. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about some work done with a student, Yan Lin Lee, and uh, Professor Adrian Perig. Yan Lin's actually in the back of the room with a shirt that matches my own, so it'll be easy to pick out. Um, what I want to talk about today is the integrity of peripherals firmware. Um, what I mean by a peripheral is really anything inside your computer and anything that you might immediately plug into your computer. And with that in mind, uh, what, what is this diagram? We have multiple processors, but then we have some pieces that sort of sound like components of a system. Memory controller, graphics controller, USB controller, disk controller. You know, I've heard of these things before. And, and this is sort of a really simple view of a chipset, or the, the main components inside of our modern PCs. And an important question is, what code runs on these other CPUs? Right? It, it's easy to, to take a, a naive assumption that these are all you know, hardware, silicon only. There's nothing an attacker could do there, but that, that's just not true. A lot of them have firmware. You know, they basically run software on their own little processor. And I want to focus, uh, for practical purposes, uh, largely on a network controller. Uh, we pick the network controller because that's usually how the bad guy gains access to the system. Uh, and it's a good example for... Uh, a lot of the things that I want to talk about today. So, network controller. In 2008, a guy named Arrigo Triulzi figured out how he could inject his own code into the firmware inside a network controller. Now, he went out and bought like a 10-pack of these PCI cards and was just curious about what he could figure out. A tech-savvy guy, not necessarily an attacker by training uh, or profession and was able, in fact, to inject code into this card, which he happened to physically possess. Now, the, the microcontroller environment in that card was sort of resource, resource impoverished, and he wanted to do more things. And he figured out you could do some kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication between the network card and the graphics card. And our, our modern graphics processors have lots of resources, very powerful processors, significant memory. <clears throat> So that was a white hat guy doing a proof of concept. Not long afterwards, another guy by the name of Chen figured out how to compromise the firmware in the Apple aluminum keyboard. Now it doesn't take long uh, before a clever attacker can use that to log a few passwords and compromise the host itself. Likewise, uh, a more disconcerting vulnerability was discovered in a Broadcom NIC. This actually is a network facing vulnerability, so you don't have to have physical control of the host to do this kind of attack. Um, you know, compromise the network card, maybe you can compromise the rest of the host. And in fact, let's take a look at what some of the things that a compromised peripheral might be able to do. They can easily eavesdrop on data handled by peripherals, right? If you have control of the network card, you can see what comes and goes on the network. Uh, modern high-speed devices use DMA, right? Direct memory access to uh, improve their performance. If this isn't configured very carefully, and today's modern hypervisors and operating systems are only just starting to be able to do this, then a malicious device might be able to use DMA to access other portions of memory. It might be able to exfiltrate data, or it might be able to modify executable software as it sits in RAM. The uh, initial example already showed that one peripheral might be able to somehow compromise another, or maybe not even compromise, but just bend to its will uh, another peripheral to help perpetrate malicious actions. Sort of the, uh, the epitome of this is a system that's a bot without actually having a compromised operating system, right? Even if we all ran verified microkernels, you still might have the case where the firmware in the NIC is compromised, takes advantage of compute resources on the graphics processor, and sends spam or launches denial of service attacks or does whatever it might do. So, you know, I hope I've convinced you that this is a problem. Now, what's the state of the art for firmware security on our commodity stuff today? Well, uh, one thing that the secure, security community has pushed for, and which I think was a step in the right direction, is signed, digitally signed firmware or microcode or BIOS updates or whatever. 
Whoever the vendor is that produced that device, they should be the authority that gets to decide whether the firmware gets updated. Now, usually this requires something like a public key fingerprint stored immutably in hardware. Do we really think that every vendor does that, that it's immutable in hardware, or do we think that some of them just include it in the current software version? You know, I think a study of the devices on the market would show examples of both. And that's a problem, because what if there's a vulnerability, right? It's, it's uh, sort of a hi historically the case that a, a lot of computer security takes this, I'm going to defend against things coming in from outside and assume that internally I'm OK. Right? But that, that whole house of cards collapses as soon as there's vulnerability somewhere. And an example is something that Intel recently announced. Intel has added some hardware security features to their chipsets and processors recently. And it's something where we've done a lot of research and actually do find that they can you know, take things in the right direction. But unfortunately, they depended on some signed code. And that signed code had a vulnerability. In order to work around that vulnerability, Intel's fix required changes to this signed code, every piece that they'd ever released to date. And it requires changes to the microcode in the processor itself. Now, on our modern processors, microcode's ephemeral. So this means every single time you power up the system, you have to apply a microcode patch. And that requirement means, well, the vendor-specific bias has to change. And so what I really want to illustrate is that some of the hardware-based security mechanisms or the, the, the security mechanisms built around you know, assuming a fairly rigid security perimeter aren't very practical. You know, in an enterprise environment, rolling back a BIOS version is important. But if, if you can roll back a BIOS version, then you might be able to roll back to a vulnerable BIOS version. So we need to do more. Just signing our firmware or our code is not going to get us all the way there. So. We want to be able to detect problems with the firmware in our peripherals. They're fairly resource impoverished. They may only have a few kilobytes of RAM. Uh, the CPUs are not high performance as compared to the main processors. Um, Hardware-based protections that we've already seen can be expensive and don't necessarily solve all the problems. So we want to make sure that these devices are working the way they're supposed to be. Why? Because we want security not just for our operating system or not just for our application, but for the full system. Right? There, have been, there have been some advances on how to do things on the primary processor, but that's not enough. Right? We want to know that the whole thing works. And the, the architecture today is complex. You know, how do you approach this? Should we start with the primary CPUs? Do we then go to the devices that are closest to the CPU, maybe the dev devices with the most memory? You know, what is the right way to think about this and approach systematically verifying all the little subsystems in our PCs? And so the contributions of the work that I want to talk about are, first, we systematically analyze malware features on computer peripherals. For the purposes of this talk, I've already said what I want to say about the malware on these things. You can reference the papers that I'll show you at the end if you want to learn more. We propose Viper, which is verifying integrity of peripherals a software-only primitive that has the goal of, in fact, verifying that what's running inside a device is what's supposed to be there. In order to build Viper, we make some changes to some previously proposed attestation protocols that improve their resilience against some specific attacks. To show this is practical, we actually implement it on a network card that uses open source firmware. So our assumptions are that physical attacks are out of scope. This is important. Now, if the bad guy has your computer in his possession, there are other kinds of things he might be able to do. So we're really talking about trying to defend against you know, large-scale automated attacks coming in over the network. We want to make sure that those won't work. We need to assume the existence of some kind of verifier program on the host CPU. We're going to start from the assumption that whatever these vendors are doing to make execution on the host CPU secure, that it actually works. And finally, we're going to assume that this verifier program knows something about the peripherals in that specific system. So this verifier program is unfortunately not so general as to work with you know, any network card. It needs to know what network card you have. We're going to allow the attacker to compromise the firmware inside the peripheral. Our goal is to be able to detect that that has happened and you know, take some kind of remediating action. We assume that the attacker has on its own premises an enormous amount of computational capability. 
You know, it could control a whole data center worth of its own machines to try to do some brute force attacks or something. Um, however, we, we also uh, assume that the attacker is not able to break standard cryptographic primitives. So the main tool that we want to use to build this is something called attestation for integrity. And that the goal of attestation is to verify what software is executing on a device that's potentially untrusted. This is a very powerful property because it enables this verifier to infer, in fact, what is going on on that device that I can't directly see. In order to make sense out of one of these attestations, it's necessary to have you know, some golden database, some expectations about what's supposed to be there. And there are many uses beyond uh, what's in the literature to date on attestation. You know, verifying firmware like we're talking about today, mobile devices, you know, embedded medical devices, lots of applications for this stuff. So it's a a nice general te technology. And this diagram is sort of the simplest view of a challenge response attestation protocol. You have some verifier, this green V, uh, who has a database of known good software, of expectations about what's supposed to be going on in some otherwise unknown device. And he's going to send some kind of challenge or cryptographic nonce over to the system or device or whatever it is that's in an unknown state and get back some kind of message that can convince him of the state of that device. You know, the, the most obvious attack is that the, the target system doesn't just lie and say exactly what the verifier wants to hear. You know, the, the trick to one of these protocols is to figure out how to prevent the target system from lying in its response. So a software-based attestation mechanism can do one of these protocols without any hardware support. We have no secure coprocessor. We have no you know, embedded private key. We have no trusted platform module. We're just operating in software. This is important because a lot of legacy devices have no support. And a lot of constrained devices even today cannot afford support. Right? Cost, size, weight, power, area, heat, any one of these things could be a very valid practical reason why you can't make hardware changes in order to improve security. So this is a, a, a mildly enhanced version of the previous figure where on the untrusted device, when the nonce arrives, it's going to run some software that's specific to helping us learn about the state in that device. Back is going to come again some kind of result, some kind of checksum. And the verifier has two jobs now. He doesn't just check that the answer is the expected answer and incorporates the nonce and is fresh and all the standard things you do in a challenge response protocol, but he's also going to time it. So we have two characteristics, uh, checksum value and timing. And with these two characteristics, we can create what we call a software-only root of trust. When we have one of these roots of trust, malicious code or operations in the target system should either result in an invalid checksum or in longer computation. So in order to achieve this, you know, we need some specific components in each system. On a peripheral device, that we're trying to understand, we need the checksum function itself, some code to communicate results back to the verifier, and then something that resembles a more traditional cryptographic hash function so that we can learn integrity characteristics of much larger swaths of memory. Um, again, because timing considerations matter here, we don't necessarily want to say, just run SHA-1 over all of RAM. On the host CPU, which is our verifier here and which we're assuming to be trusted, we need a checksum simulator. This simulator's responsibility is to, is to form expectations about what should come back from that peripheral device. You know, the, the verifier program here knows what should happen on that peripheral device. In order for that simulator to make sense, it needs a copy of the expected firmware, and then it needs a timer in order to measure how long these things actually take. The protocol involves a nonce, as before. Then, on the peripheral device, we're going to invoke what we call an untampered execution environment. This is something like disabling interrupts, making sure we're in the most privileged execution context on that hardware, things so that it's difficult for the adversary to get a trap or some other kind of hook to execute their own code. Once we're done, the communication function sends back the checksum. This is the end of the timing critical phase. Once the checksum's been transmitted, the hash function can be invoked, 
and do a more traditional hash of whatever code is on the device. You know, if you contrast this with something that's based on a digital signature, the code that is signed is a sort of equivalent to the code that we would hash here with this protocol. The checksum function is primarily concerned with itself, its own components being the checksum function, the communication function, and the hash function. Now, because of these time constraints, you know, time constraints on the runtime of some kind of computation, we run the risk of the bad guy somehow figuring out how to use more powerful compute hardware to beat us. We call this a proxy attack, where the, there's some kind of helper. You know, and in the case of a, a peripheral that we want to verify, where the peripheral is a network card, the obvious helper is you know, an entire data center connected to the Ethernet port of that network card we want to verify. And so it's basically a man-in-the-middle attack where the verifier forwards the nonce to the helper, the helper does the hard work, and sends the result back. You know, and if the, the helper is sufficiently fast as compared to the expected device that should have been running this, then maybe the helper can win. You know, again, this is a malicious helper. So this has been a problem that's plagued software-based roots of trust since research on them has, has started. One of the assumptions that work to date has always made is that we have like an authenticated communication channel between the verifier and the peripheral itself to make sure that there was no helper involved. Now here, we're trying to remove one of those assumptions. Now before, we had to make sure that if there was a network interface, it was somehow disabled so that the bad guy couldn't communicate over the internet with a more powerful system. We want to remove that assumption and be able to do useful verification work even if there is a bad guy connected to the network port. And the reason peripherals are exciting is because we think there's an architecture that's practical that lets us remove that assumption. You know, before this communication overhead was a problem, you know, uh, the, the legitimate communication overhead between, say, the host CPU acting as verifier and the network card, right, even though the PCI bus is fast, there's communication overhead there. And, you know, we used to have to tweak these algorithms to run as fast as possible and or potentially to consume more time to overcome this, you know, this wasted time, this communication overhead. And what we want to do here is actually leverage this latency to our benefit. With peripherals, the communication overhead is well understood. They tend to connect via a bus, not via a network. Um, and it's generally the case that you know, there's a higher throughput connection from the CPU to a peripheral than there is between the peripheral and the outside world. Uh, a second advantage, uh, and this gets to a challenge that I haven't even gone into detail on, is what is the memory image of a device supposed to be? You know, maybe you know what the memory image of the executable software is supposed to be, but a network card might have a buffer in there with packets you know, that only recently arrived. And expecting the verifier to somehow infer what should the contents of the you know, packet buffer be uh, is a significant challenge. You know? And in that example, okay, maybe you don't care what the packet buffer is, but there are gray areas. There are configuration registers, there's runtime state, where it's not obvious how to tell the verifier what to expect in there. Um, and thankfully, with all the power management support going into our peripheral devices today, periodic reset is becoming increasingly less disruptive. It's very normal for my system to power down my hard drive if there hasn't been a disk access in a while. So likewise with other subsystems. Okay, so what do we know about communication with peripherals? Like I said, we tend to use a bus not a network, something with you know, better uh, reliability or bandwidth or throughput properties than a network. Um, there are several different ways that one might communicate with a device, and these each have different uh, pros and cons when it comes time to try to develop a verification system. But in general, you know, the, the, the takeaway message is between the processor and the peripheral, you have a fat pipe, and between the peripheral and the rest of the world, you have a skinnier pipe. And these asymmetries are, for once, in the defender's favor. We can take advantage of this to build a defense mechanism. The types of asymmetries that I specifically want to mention are latency, you know, round trip time, throughput, how many bits can you shovel through, 
variants or jitter, you know, how reliable is, are the measurements of latency or throughput and loss rate. You know, there are occasionally errors on buses, but compared to Ethernet segments, they're pretty infrequent. Uh, finally, an economic and, uh, argument helps to keep these asymmetries in place. It's very unlikely that an OEM would spend money on a gigabit NIC if the bus hooking that NIC back to the processor couldn't keep up. So let's actually get into a little bit more detail now and think about time really on the granularity of nanoseconds. I want to talk about a benign case first where we have you know, a host processor running some kind of verification code and a peripheral that's going to run this checksum function. There are three main time periods of interest to us here. The time that it takes the processor to send the nonce to that peripheral, and that's this angled line you know, with time moving to the right from the host CPU to the peripheral. Then the peripheral device is going to invoke this checksum routine, and that's going to take some amount of time, right? T peripheral computation. When it gets done, it'll send back a checksum. So we have the time that the CPU takes to receive the checksum. So that's fine, right? That sort of makes intuitive sense. As long as you think about time moving at nanosecond or microsecond level, it's not instant that a, a message gets from the processor to the peripheral device. Now, under the conditions of a proxy attack, which is the main attack that we want to innovate to do something about, we have some addition. We have, well, first of all, we have another player here, this proxy helper. So again, think of the bad guy hooked up via the Ethernet cable. The compromised peripheral is going to forward that nonce on to the proxy helper. So we have additional communication latency or this first red angled error where the nonce gets forwarded along the Ethernet link to the bad guy, uh, to the bad guy's helper system. Then that helper is going to have to do the actual computation to come up with the correct answer. When he finishes, he'll send that checksum result back to the peripheral device in order to forward it on to the verifier program on the main CPU, because he wants to convince that program that the peripheral is in a good state. So we have these additional red overheads down here. And what that means is the total runtime has some additional overhead. And it's this overhead that we want to use to help us detect one of these proxy attacks. Now, if we can set some kind of threshold to the left-hand side of that overhead and say that's a legitimate execution, and anything that takes longer than that, you know, we make the conclusion that that overhead is caused by malicious activity. So then the question is, how stable are these parameters? Can we defend against one of these proxy attacks all the time? The parameters that we care about the most are the time that the helper actually takes to compute the proxy, or, or that the proxy actually takes to compute the expected checksum. And we're going to take a conservative position there and say zero. We're going to assume that the, the helper actually knows the answer. He just has to be asked. And in, in reality, he's going to have to do some kind of sophisticated computation, but we're going to discount that because we think we can get security properties even if that computation is instantaneous. The second parameter is the communication time to get the message from the peripheral device out to that proxy helper. We want to compare those against the legitimate checksum computation time. Right? In the benign case, that checksum ran on this you know, embedded processor in a network card. That takes some amount of time. And finally, we care about the timing resolution on the host CPU. Right? The host CPU is our verifier that's making measurements of times. And there's some limit to how accurately it can measure, for example, a single nanosecond. So what are our constraints? We need the proxy communication time to take longer than the legitimate peripheral checksum computation time. Right? If, the, if the communication overhead introduced by this Ethernet link out to the helper is less time than the, computa the legitimate computation would have taken, then the bad guy is in a good position. So, so we have this first constraint. Yeah, question. Yes, uh, are you assuming that the, uh, the um, legitimate checksum computation is optimal? And if so, is that a reasonable assumption? Uh, yeah, so we are assuming that the legitimate checksum computation is optimal. Um, as far as I would like not to make that assumption, uh, 
Uh, that is not an identifying characteristic of this particular software at a station work. That's been an assumption that all prior software at a station work has had to make. Um, there are some recent ongoing thoughts into how to do constraints based on like memory size instead of uh, optimality of computation that are hopefully going to push that towards something more practical. Um, one of the reasons I get excited about this communication latency based version of this is actually maybe if we can bound these parameters well enough we don't have to assume it's optimal because the bad guy well optimal it becomes a, a weaker form of optimal if the bad guy can find a better way to compute it locally on the peripheral device on that weak processor then he could still win but if he has to incur this network communication overhead, then it becomes hard for him. Um, so, yeah, it's still not a perfect world, but it's a step in the right direction. Okay, using this previous constraint that we want the communication to take longer than the legitimate computation, we can say that the proxy overhead is going to be at a minimum the communication time minus the legitimate computation time. And that tells us, or fi sorry, finally, one last constraint is that whatever that overhead is, we need to be able to measure it. Right? If that overhead is a single CPU cycle on an x86 processor, we can't accurately measure that. If it's a couple thousand, then we can reliably determine that it, you know, in fact took longer. Um, So these are the main practical constraints for setting up a software-based attestation protocol where we take advantage of latency to make it a lot more difficult for, the, for this proxy helper to get the right answer back on time. You know, even if he knows the right answer almost instantaneously upon receiving this nonce, he still has to incur the communication overhead. And that's an asymmetry in the defender's favor. That's one of the things that gets us excited about this type of work. Now, because of these constraints, we want the checksum routine that runs on the peripheral to run as quickly as possible. Because if it takes a long time, then maybe the overhead of an Ethernet round trip isn't enough overhead to be detectable. In a naive version of this kind of protocol, well, let me, st let me say, you know, a consequence of that is we don't do a one-shot invocation of the checksum function. We do a lot of different round trips, you know, new nonces, new checksum computations of, of just a portion of the memory space of interest. And we do enough of those that with high probability, we've covered the whole memory space of interest. And so the naive way to do that is you send a nonce from the host CPU to the peripheral, some computation takes place running the checksum function and the answer comes back. Once you receive the answer, there's some amount of idle time on the peripheral before the next nonce comes back from the host CPU. So we have this idle time, right? this repeats. So between each round trip, we have this idle time. And that's an advantage to the adversary. This uh, uh, recent question was a very good example. You know, we're still depending on a certain amount of, of checksum optimality on the network card itself. And this idle time is time where the bad guy might be able to compute on the network card itself to gain some kind of advantage. So we'd like to be able to eliminate that. Right? Any underutilized resource might be something that the attacker can use to gain an advantage. And so the intuition between an improvement is, let's just compute and communicate at the same time. Um, and in fact, let's do a little bit better than that. So at the beginning, the, the host CPU sends the first nonce, the first round of checksum computation takes place, but now we're going to take advantage of some simultaneous communication. If the host CPU knows when to expect that peripheral to terminate its checksum, and in general it can know that with a reasonable degree of accuracy, then the host CPU can send the next nonce early. And the way to think about this is nonce 2 is making its way across like the PCI bus while the little microcontroller inside the network card is actually still doing computation. And if you time it nicely, then nonce 2 will get there just as that computation is finishing. And it can actually influence which portion of the checksum comes back 
as part of checksum one. So internally to this checksum function, we maintain more state than we can send back in a single round trip, you know, in a single uh, like bus message from the network card back to the processor over the PCI bus. And so if you do this subsequently, then you can keep computation running on the network device all the time. And you know, when the second round of computation runs here, the third nonce will arrive and say which portion of the checksum state should be selected for use as checksum two. And so this makes it a lot harder for the adversary to infer ahead of time you know, anything about the state of this checksum, anything about the, the answers that the host CPU is expecting to receive. And so we've eliminated a good amount of idle time here, further, uh, 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 which in a sense gives us a little wiggle room in terms of how optimal our checksum function needs to be. Okay, so what I've just described is uh, some novel enhancements to a software-based checksum routine that take advantage of communication latency, the differences between communication and computation on a peripheral device. We can take advantage of that to build up our actual system to verify the integrity on peripheral devices. So this time, the challenge response protocol, you know, as compared to earlier work on software-based attestation, is not just one nonce and one checksum coming back. It's actually a big, long ping-pong series of nonces and checksums in quick succession. That gives us our software root of trust and establishes our untampered execution environment. You know, from that point, things work as they do with other software-based root of trust and software-based attestation mechanisms. We invoke the hash function. It can send back the hash of the actual full target code of interest, you know, not just these three listed on the right here. So we've prototyped this system using a Netgear Gigabit NIC um, in a Sunfire rack mount server. It's uh, slightly old by modern standards. I think it's maybe five, six years old. Um, this particular network card actually has two microcontrollers inside it. So yes, there are dual core network cards. Um, it has four megabytes of SRAM embedded within itself. It uses an open source firmware. We happen to use this particular version of it. Um, we developed our checksum and communication code as we discussed here. It took 656 MIPS instructions, so it's not a huge piece of code. Um, that's not including the SHA-1 hash function, which you know, we, we use. I'm not, we used an open source implementation of it that was available to us. Um, the rack mount server has a single core main processor. That was easier for us to be able to uh, not worry about which processor was receiving messages for the network card. So inside this network card, there's CPU A and CPU B, and there's this shared SRAM region. And then there's this scratch pad memory, which is some memory that's uh, sort of tightly coupled to these processors. It has better performance characteristics that's specific to each processor. So CPU A's 16 kilobytes of scratch pad memory are not accessible to CPU B. Likewise, CPU B's scratch pad memory is not available to CPU A. And that actually helps us out, because if we take a naive approach and stick our checksum and communication and hash functions in this SRAM, then we either have to somehow perfectly synchronize CPUs A and B so we know what they're doing at all times, or we have to do one after the other. And if we do, without loss of generality, A first, then at the same time, B can be running some malicious code and tamper with the checksum function as it goes. So it's good for our purposes that we have this scratch pad memory that's specific to each processor. So how we actually structure the verification procedure is to put checksum function and communication functions in the scratch pad memory for each particular processor. Now there's not room for a hash function in both of them, but that's no problem. Right? The purpose of the hash function here is to help us verify the rest of the SRAM. Now the checksum function, let's see, the checksum function inside of CPU B is going to first verify only itself, right? Only the code and the scratchpad memory of CPU B. 
once it finishes, the program counter can stay in there, right? It can stay in some kind of pending loop, waiting for um, the same operations to complete on CPU A. Since we've already verified the code, we know what code's in CPU B, and we trust that it'll stay there. Then CPU A goes ahead and does the same thing. It runs a software-based checksum over its scratchpad memory contents, which in this case do include a hash function. The hash function can then be used to compute the hash over the rest of the firmware of interest. In this case, that includes software and, and information in the SRAM. So the checksum function design that we used here employs 32 distinct checksum blocks. So each time uh, one of these nonces comes back, it's helping to, se to select one of these blocks. Um, we work to utilize all general purpose registers inside these microcontrollers. There are 31 available registers. We make sure that there's important state in all of them, that it changes as rapidly as we know how to make it change, so that there's no extra registers available that a, that a malicious code might be able to use to try to get you know, a more optimal implementation. The basic idea of the checksum is to implement it in such a way that it cannot be parallelized. So we use strongly ordered AND and XOR operations. There's not an algebraic speed up for those. We have to include state about the processor. And we need to know the program counter. We have this notion of data pointer, which is which part of the, the scratch pad memory is currently being incorporated into the checksum. Other checksum states, you know, other register values, SRAM memory contents. We want to pull in as much information about the state of that microcontroller as we can, because if there's any deviation in any of that state, that's a sign to us that something's gone wrong. We structure the size of each checksum block to fit perfectly into a cache line. Now, in this case, in these processors, an instruction cache is 16 fixed width 4 byte MIPS instructions. This way, any additional code, or, or yeah, additional code put into the, the checksum routine is going to cause more cache misses. Right? Cache misses are a nice way to add additional overhead. It's not the overhead of just one more instruction execution. It's the overhead of actually going out to get it. So in our evaluation, we wanted to consider what we think are the best attacks against this. So one of these is the Ethernet-based proxy attack, which I've spent the most time telling you about. You know, we're trying to take advantage of this latency asymmetry, CPU to NIC versus NIC to helper, to make sure that an Ethernet-based proxy attack is not going to have a good chance. The two most commonly uh, Let's see, to the extent that there's an established uh, thinking about software-based attestation, this data pointer forging and program counter forging attacks are the best ways to attack these checksum functions. And so we wanted to implement what, to the best of our knowledge, or, you know, is the best attack that we could come up with. So we implemented all three of these attacks and found right away that the actual latency introduced by this round trip on Ethernet was a lot higher than what we sort of theoretically calculated that it ought to be based on the characteristics of Ethernet. So we actually made changes to the firmware in the proxy helper's Ethernet card as well to just send back a response as soon as it gets the message inside the actual hardware so that we don't even have to traverse up to the you know, operating system or application on the proxy helper. So we, we really worked hard to implement the Ethernet-based proxy attack um, you know, with, the, with as few sources of additional overhead as possible. And it still came in at 43 microseconds, which from our defender's perspective is awesome. That's, that's, a, that's an eternity compared to the round trip time between the main CPU and the network card. Now the calculating what we thought the best performance achievable with gigabit ethernet would be, we came up with this theoretical proxy attack at 1.2 microseconds. So that starts to be a lot closer to the range of interest we have to really think, is that enough overhead to prevent these attacks? For both the data pointer and program counter forging attacks, the best implementation on this particular microarchitecture turned out to have five extra instructions, which caused two extra cache misses. So the overhead, uh, the computational overhead in the checksum function, if the bad guy tries to attack this system locally on the NIC, is five extra MIPS instructions and two extra cache misses. If he tries to go 
you know, with an extremely powerful proxy helper, then the theoretical quickest response time he could have is 1.2 microseconds. You know, in practice, we measured that at 43. Putting all of this in graphical form, the 43 microseconds is way, way off the top of this graph. So we only show the theoretical proxy attack, which is the topmost red line. We have, you know, elapsed time on the y-axis, trials across the bottom to sort of give you a feel for how consistent any individual run of this is. Um, the program counter and data pointer forging attacks are the blue and green line clustered up there at the top by the theoretical best proxy attack. The benign case for normal computation is this line right in the center there. And we selected a threshold at 4.5% over the benign case. And for this particular configuration, that worked. We had a, a nice separation of the benign case and the various attacks up top. You know, we didn't really have any outliers that crossed the threshold. You know, if that were the case, you might have to run the whole thing more than one time and, and, and you know, devise some policies about how many successes uh, you need in order to conclude that everything's OK. So we were encouraged by these evaluation results. You know, this additional latency, even in the theoretical best case, is enough that it's detectable. You know, the, the taking a more vanilla software station approach, the program counter and data pointer forging attacks you know, were also detectable. Again, I can't mathematically prove that our checksum routine is optimal or that these are the best possible attacks. That's ongoing work. A lot of us would love to get those results. Um, but you know, doing the best that we can do to date so far, we're still encouraged by this. So some practical considerations. Let's say as a vendor or a security uh, company or something like this, we're willing to take on faith that that stuff's optimal enough. And we want to think about, well, all right, how can we actually deploy this in our systems and improve their resistance to various attacks? To do full system verification, you need to start with the most powerful peripherals. Right? There's another kind of proxy attack, which is inside my PC. You know, if my main processor is currently trying to do this verification routine I just discussed with my keyboard, you know, the keyboard is a very low performance peripheral device. It would be easy for, you know, a graphics card to masquerade as a keyboard if it had the right malicious firmware inside it. So it's necessary to start with the most capable peripheral devices. You know, right now, we've sort of naively been assuming that the most powerful thing is the primary CPU, the next most powerful is graphics, and that it sort of filters down from there. You know, an important next uh, step is to figure that out. You know, the graphics card is a very different kind of processor than our main processor. How to do such a, a massively parallel software to station checksum routine is something we haven't looked at in great detail. It was a, a, it's an interesting problem, and I think the answer is going to look different from what it looks like on, a, on a, something like an x86 processor. The other practical challenge is managing expectations. What, what firmware is supposed to be in my South Bridge? I have no idea. Right? I could try to get in there and read it out, assume that it's OK, and make sure it doesn't change. But that's really not a scalable or practical solution. And so it really seems like reverse engineering out expectations for these devices might be difficult. And that for it to be practical, you sort of need buy-in from the vendors. Um, you know, the vendors need to say, OK, well, here's the design of our firmware inside this peripheral. This is the code. This is data that you don't have to care about. This is data that's important, you know, a, a tantamount to configuration. So these are a couple of important practical considerations to deploy something like this, even if the sort of mathematical concerns are, are resolved. There's a decent body of related work on software-based attestation now. The, the one I want to draw our attention to the most is by a guy by the name of Lord Duflo. He also looked at the security of peripheral devices, and he proposed a solution in particular for that Broadcom NIC that has the um, remotely exploitable vulnerability uh, that takes advantage of that NIC's debugging features. So it puts the NIC in a special mode, uh, which is sort of a developer's debugging mode. and and on top of that, he constructs a security architecture. You know, it so happened that the debugging features in that NIC 
were such that he could do that. Um, that's not a general solution, right? That, that sort of amounts to a hardware change for devices to support some kind of verification. So to wrap things up, I hope I've convinced you that the integrity of the firmware and subsystems or pieces of our, our computers that we tend not to even think about is important. Right? There are ever more always on features in our systems. There are other examples of vulnerabilities. There, there was a vulnerability in the firmware in the battery of MacBooks. There was a vulnerability in Intel active management technology, which is an always on feature, portions of which are always on, even if you go into the BIOS settings and try to turn them off. Um, you know, as, as our computers are a lot more than a main processor memory and a, uh, you know, a few dumb peripherals, we, we need to think about these things. Software-based attestation is actually pretty well suited to the problem of verifying the integrity where we, we have a good understanding of the communication pathways and we know the buses that these devices should be connecting over. In particular, these proxy attacks that have really been a problem for prior software-based attestation schemes can be handled in a pretty decent way for peripherals. You know, this unique environment enables a lot of new divines, designs. I talked about the latency-based version. You could imagine a throughput-based version, a variance-based version, a, you know, reliability-based version. It's also the case that thanks to things like power saving, resetting the state of a peripheral device back to some known state isn't that disruptive. Um, you know, my, the whole thing might be able to com complete in well under a second. So if, if I'm sitting here using my laptop and the network goes down for less than a second a couple times a day, I barely notice that. Um, we showed that it can be implemented in a reasonable way on an existing network card. And we're really excited that you know, these are, are starting to make this stuff look practical uh, for at least some real world problems on at least some current platforms. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope you found this interesting. These are two of the papers that we've published that describe this. Um, you can get in touch with me here, Yanlin in the back, Dr. Adrian. You know, we're always we're always interested to hear what people think about this. So thank you. I don't think we have a moderator for questions. So I'll just point. <laughs> yeah. So my question has to do with why an attacker can't compress the image and then use it as a reference for executing the checksum. Um, he might be able to do something like that. You know, that, that might be a strategy that the adversary uses. For example, executable code is generally fairly compressible. So he might be able to reduce the amount of time it takes to communicate something in exchange for a little bit more computation. And so, that, yeah, there is some, you know, sweet spot between doing computation locally on the compromised peripheral and outsourcing computation to some kind of helper. Um, we like to think that our model takes that into consideration, but, um, you know, it, it really, again, comes back to just how optimal is this checksum function inside the peripheral device. Yeah, so that could be a big problem. Um, one of the assumptions that we made somewhere early was that we don't have, the bad guy doesn't have physical access to, sorry, I won't worry about that, um, that the bad guy doesn't have physical access to the target system. So that, that implies another assumption, that you can't overclock it without physically touching it. Um, I know there are some BIOSes for ordinary x86 processors where you actually can configure overclocking in software. I'm not aware of any peripheral devices where that's the case, although maybe there are some GPUs that have that, I'm not sure. So that would be a, something that needs to be taken into consideration. We're making the assumption, for example, for this network card that you can't overclock it without physically touching it. Okay, well. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'll be here for a few more minutes. Take care.